Okay, welcome everyone to our Castor webinar series. Uh, I am Ritesh Mystery. Uh, we are part of the T-Course 2.0 uh, Consortium, and uh, we are at the, the site at U of M and Georgetown University. It's a pleasure today to have Dr. Luz Sanchez Romero be our speaker for this webinar series, uh, Luz Sanchez Romero is an assistant professor at Georgetown University. Um, she focuses on the use of simulation modeling on the estimate of long-term population health impacts of health policies and preventive health inter interventions. In particular, her expertise assesses tobacco regulations and obesity prevention interventions. She's part of the Cancer Prevention and Control Program at the Lombardi Cancer Comprehensive Cancer Center at Georgetown University. And she's part of the CISNET Lung Group and the T-Course Consortium, which are funded by NIH and NCI. Uh, today, she's gonna be talking about her K Award, a K01 Award awarded by NCI, uh, which focuses on tobacco regulation and its impact on long-term trends on COPD. So we're really uh, pleased to have Luz Sma join us. And, uh, talk about our research. She's one of our junior researchers at the Castor site. So please share your work and begin when you're ready. Actually, you. I have a couple of housekeeping things I forgot about. One is we do have forty one hour uh, webinar today. It'll be 40 minutes and followed by 15 minutes Q&A. Uh, you can submit your Q&A uh, questions at, at any time using the Q&A feature at, on the on the webinar, uh, Zoom webinar. And we'll... Um, address those questions at the end of the, of the talk. And after the talk, there will be a, a short five question evaluation form, which I ask you to fill out. It helps us a lot to track our, the quality of our work and, and, our, and our activities through our center. Finally, before Luzma gets started, uh, we do have an upcoming webinar. Uh, we have a series of these webinars uh, throughout the year. So please look out for the next one, which will be uh, presented by Dr. Krishna Reddy. Uh, from Mass General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. He's be talk, going to be talking about microsimulation modeling of the colliding epidemics of tobacco and HIV. Uh, now, without further ado, Lusma, please uh, begin when you're ready. Thank you so much, Ritesh, and thank you so much, Castor T. Kurs, for the invitation. Uh, so, yeah, I'm going to start my presentation. Perfect. I think there, I tested, so I think there are no issues with it. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you about my K Award. And I want to do this talk um, more, more for the general population to understand what it takes when we develop a simulation model and that everything is not as simple and, and straightforward as we imagine at the beginning. Uh, just a couple of things. This is my funding. I received funding, as, as it was mentioned, from NCI NIH. And my care award is funded by NIH and FDA. It's a training award. A couple of, uh, just one thing. All the results that I'm going to present today are preliminary results. Nothing is yet published. We are close to submit uh, these uh, two or three papers uh, in a couple of months. So just be careful when you disseminate these results. So first of all, because I noticed uh, there's a lot of people in the audience that don't know, understand what simulation models are. They know how can we develop. So very little, very quick is simulation models, we use them to create the scenarios of what is. Right? How we take a photo of a population the way it is now, and we project it like 20 years to try to uh, look into the future and see and, and tested some hypothetical um, scenarios. For this specific model, what I want to test later in the future is how potential uh, new regulations on tobacco control are going to impact COPD. This is a diagram here. This is a diagram of how simulation models are uh, developed. So first we got the problem, some introduction of the variables we build the simulation model and we go through the process of validation uh, and calibration, and that takes some time. For the presentation today, I'm going to focus on these three in these three aspects. 
formulation of the problem, development of the variables, and construction of the simulation model. So first of all, my model, my project as a K, uh, the title is Modeling the Impact of Tobacco Regulations on the U.S. Future Trends of Chronic Obstructive Pulmonary Disease. And the idea is to build a COPD natural history model based on the smoking histories that will predict the long-term impact of two FDA tobacco, uh, tobacco regulations. I know a lot of you are not uh, clinicians or don't have a medical background, so I'm just going to quickly explain what COPD is. So why do we choose COPD? The COPD is a pulmonary disease. It's the fourth cause of death in the U.S. and third cause of disability. For the U.S., they projected uh, that, are, that COPD costs around $49 billion annually. One of eight adults in the U.S. have a more um, ages 40, 45 years or older have COPD. And we find a lot of under diagnosis of this disease because at the beginning of the stages it can be think you know as just cough or a little bit of asthma one of the main preventable factors of copd is cigarette use and cessation uh smoking cessation is one of the main interventions when copd is diagnosed just to see a little bit of the problem i because you know uh, castor t course is at georgetown and also uh, in dc and University of Michigan and Arbor. So I just uh, find this in the CDC website of how many people are with COPD in those states. More a little bit about COPD. So what COPD is, is it's a progressive but preventable pulmonary disease that it's characterized by an obstruction and that's uh, chronic bronchitis, but it also it's caused by emphysema. So it puts everything in like an umbrella so chronic bronchitis, as we can see in the figure here, it creates an obstruction and limits the airflow. Emphysema, what it does is the alveoli, which is where we transport the oxygen in and out, it loses, it loses elasticity. So it becomes like a like a it becomes like a rubber band that cannot get uh, stretched anymore. And all and these problems together does not allow the uh, the full air of our lungs to go out. So that means that every time we expire, inspire, and there's a little bit of, of um, air trapping into our lungs, and then make it, it makes it more difficult for people to breathe. Once you have COPD and once it's properly diagnosed, there's no going back. It's, it's just a progressive disease of so what people do. It's treating symptoms and try to decrease the progression of the disease. That's why it's very important. Now, in recent years, Besides COPD, there start coming more articles about another pattern, which is similar to COPD, which we are going to call PRISM, or it's preserve ratio spirometry. And it's a pattern of obstruction in the lungs that it doesn't, it doesn't fulfill with the diagnostic of obstruction for COPD, but the person that has this has also an impairment in the airflow, so they have low elasticity of the alveoli. That's why some of them say uh, PRISMA is also known or was also known as unclassified, non specific or restrictive pulmonary disease. And before this, before this term was created or noticed more in the, into the uh, scientific community, all these people that were, you know, like in the limbo, not totally right, but they don't have COPD, they were, uh, they were just left out without treatment. However, we've seen that uh, this prism, uh, this prism diagnosis increased respiratory symptoms and also has an increased mortality. Uh, around seven to twelve percent, we can find a prevalence of prism in the general population, and of the smokers, twelve point five percent may have prism. So those are the terms that we're going to use during the presentation. But I'm going to put prism within COPD just for because it's easier uh, to talk to put that term on. So how do we diagnose COPD? COPD, the gold standard to diagnose COPD is by spirometry. This makes it difficult between around 30 to 60% of the patients that have previous physician diagnosed as COPD do not actually uh, have the disease. So that's very important of how we look at into in the surveys 
when they ask the question, oh, has a physician told you you have COPD? Because sometimes they attend the primary care physician, they look at the symptoms, they think it's COPD, but they will not do further, um, further studies in confirming that, or the patient forgets to go, or you know whatever happens, but it's not a COPD diagnose, uh, confirmed diagnosis. So um, that's also an important part that happen in, at the clinics in daily life. So for spirometry, the values that we use are force spirometry volume in one second and force vital capacity. We use them to estimate a ratio between F1 and FBC. If it's less than 0 0.7, then that equal to obstruction. And also a F1 percentage that, that it's low, that's also a marker that there's uh, some resistance. Uh, some resistance in airflow and also help us to classify COPD in different types so on different levels of severity. So um, for severity, the American Thoracic Association and also the pulmonologists, we evaluate severity of COPD at the beginning is using the gold standard, gold grades. Gold stands for Global Initiative of, of a Chronic Obstructive Lung Disease. So when we do spirometry, we take these two values, right? FEV1 as a percentage and the ratio of FEV1 FBC. So this is the F1 of a person with a normal airflow. Then if there's some level of obstruction, they can have prism or be classified as COPD. And then we look at which type, uh, which level of severity that individual has in terms of ranges of COPD. And we have four. One that they call them mild, two or moderate, three or severe, or four or very severe. For the purpose of my research, I stratify people in goal one, goal two, and I, uh, and I uh, group together people at goal three and four because they are at the severe stage. Oh, sorry. Now, it's important that you to know that Although cigarette use is one of the main risk factors, preventable risk factors for COPD, there are also another risk factors for COPD that are similar um, in importance, and that's like secondhand smoking, air, air pollution, some genetics, and some occupational or environmental risk factors. However, for my project, I'm going to focus on COPD associated with smoking but you have to also consider that there's a lot of cases of COPD that are associated with non-smoking. So now I'm gonna show you how I originally planned for my KV simulation model, you know, cause I have like super big expectations of my model as I assume, you know, a lot of us have. Uh, so my simulation model is gonna start, you know, with these input parameters, uh, age, gender, smoking status, then according to these parameters, I was going to classify them never, current and former smokers. I was going to stratify current smokers into light smokers or heavy smokers, and then also um, make the people transition between goal zero, prism, goal one and two, goal three and four. Um, just to clarify, goal, goal zero is no COPD. And then once they had this, the disease, then I was going to estimate the current, uh, the transitions between cigarette product use in current cigarette, e-cigarettes, and former use, and estimate all-cause mortality, respiratory disease mortality, and COPD-associated mortality. So that was the diagram I used for my K and how, um, oh sorry, I forgot, uh, and how I developed it for my um, grant. I have three aims. The first, was what, the first of this case was determining the impact of longitudinal changes in the smoking behavior. As aim two, I'm going to develop the model and estimate COPD incidence, prevalence, and COPD associated mortality. And my aim three, and my aim three sorry, was to predict the potential future trends of COPD on, under FDA tobacco regulations. For aim one, for the longitudinal changes, I was planning on using a Markov model as aim two for the COPD natural history simulation model and other inputs that I was going to use for developing the model. I, I plan on use systematic literature reviews and analysis from N. Haynes. So the input parameters that I analyzed during this, uh, I'm currently at uh, I'm currently at my second year of the K. 
So this is what I've been working on. I estimated long function parameters, that's transition probabilities, COPD mortality risks, and estimated COPD and PRISMA trends in the general population and used those for model calibration and validation. So my first analysis, as I show you, is a progression of COPD uh, using the COPD gene, and that's how COPD, once people have COPD, it moves between severity stages until they die. So uh, this is part of AIM-1, and as in, my input for the model is that I'm going to calculate the transition probability. Again, the objective of this project, transition rates between airflow limitation categories, prism and gold, for you as adults that they are ever smokers. For this analysis, I use the COPD gene cohort. The COPD gene cohort is a US observational cohort that collecting from information about COPD around 21 states in the US. And they, they originally um, collected information of smokers that they had to they had to smoke more or equal 10 packs per year, and they were age 45 to 80. The COPD gene cohort, besides these studies, have a lot of information on genetics, imaging, et cetera. Until now, we have three phases. Phase one was uh, uh, from 28 to 11, phase two, 12 to 16, and phase three, uh, 2018 to 2021. Uh, but it's still collecting phase three. We're almost finishing phase three. So it's... We can tell that it's an average of five years that they are collected information. And for my sample, I, for this analysis, because that's the way the analysis needed, is I, I only use information or individuals that had at least two smoking status observation, and they also had complete uh, post-bronchodilator values of spirometry. Now, something that I mentioned before, the diagnosis of spirometry to According to the guidelines, COPD needs to be diagnosed with post bronchodilatador spirometry values. That's very important and that's something to take into consideration when you're looking at COPD uh, analysis and research. So going back to the to going back to my matrix of my transition model, this is an example of how I build my transition matrix. So people start goal zero, remember it's normal. They, were able, they are able to move to goal one or prism. Once they reach these two states, they move to goal two and they can move to goal three and then death. But they also have you know, associated mortality with each of one of the severity levels. For the analysis, I use a Markov multi-state transition model, WMSM, and it's an R package. This specifically a uh, package of WMSM I, it was created by Dr. Andrew Brower from uh, the TCOR Center, and it's available at the Castor webpage uh, with some super nice examples and exercises if anyone wants to use them. It's similar to the MSM, but the W, it allows to add some weights. Similar transition to this analysis, you also can find in this paper. I took uh, the methodology similar to this paper. I estimated the transition probabilities from one year and five year transitions. And I also adjusted those four different sociodemographic characteristics, gender, age groups, race, smoking status, cigarette packs per year, BMI, and previous diagnosis of COPD. All of, the, all of these sociodemographic characteristics were considering um, that in the literature it has been reported, it's one of the, that they are uh, characteristics that influence the trajectory of COPD. Because it's a smoky tobacco regulation seminar, it's very important to have a to state the definition that we use when we talk about what's a smoker. So smoker in COPD gene is considered just by this question, do you currently smoke? Uh, remember that our participants have to have at least uh, more or equal time package per year consumption. Then we divide it in former or current. Do you now smoke cigarettes? as of one month ago. That's how we classify current and former in COPD gene. Now, these are results from our analysis. Um, this figure here, one-year transitions. This is five-year transitions. For the sake of the presentation, I'm just gonna show you the five years. What, I know, what we notice here is 
prism angle one, as you see, have the lowest probability of remaining in that stage after five years. And the one that has more, like is less steady than all the states, is goal one, with a probability of remaining in that in that state after five years of, of only 45%. And for Prisma, it's 48%. So those are the two. And then other thing that it's important, it's Prism as a probability of dying on 9.6% compared to go one at 6.1. So probability of Prism of dying, it's very similar to what we see in goal zero, that is 10.7. 10 now, uh, we also, as I mentioned, we also adjusted for a socioeconomic, socioeconomic variables, and and we separated into like which socioeconomic variables influence into us or intended will with COPD getting to a worse stage, to a more severe stage, or which individual or which those demographic uh, variables influence into going to a less severe stage. So going to a more severe stage, I try to make it easier. So the ones in blue are more likely and the ones in, in white are less likely. So just very brief, when we divided by age group, we saw that individuals, older, older individuals, 65 to 90, have higher probability of going from goal zero to one and have higher probability of going prison to goal two than younger individuals. In terms of race, something that is very important that uh, we observe is that non-Hispanic Blacks have higher probability to move to prison than non-Hispanic Whites, but it's the contrary, but they have less probability to move to go one uh, than non-Hispanic Whites, meaning that this transition shows that people that are non-Hispanic White can move easier to prison instead of go one. And remember, prison was a, was a state that were left for a really long time without any treatment. They also have higher probability of going from goal two to goal three and four. Uh, also, we see cigarette packs, something that, uh, that I noticed, it's intensity of smoking, here 20 or more cigarette packs, have higher, uh, gives the individual a higher probability of moving from goal zero to goal one and from goal one to goal two, but not from goal two to goal three or four, meaning that it's at early stages where the smoking intensity, uh, where the smoking intensity also helps or contributes to the progression of the disease. Because once you get goal two, then you know there's no going back. Um, I know this is may not be the correct term, but I just want I just imagine you know once you're starting go zero like normal, then you get prism and go one, you still have a chance to go back or try to prevent the disease. Then you reach goal two, you have to do a lot of changes and treatment to try to avoid or retard as long as much you progress, but it's very little progress, but you have little chance. So once you reach goal two, and I see like a man and it's like, okay, goal two, one here, and then you just go down because there's no going back and progression just will take you to death. Something that we saw very commonly is that having a previous diagnosis of COPD confer uh, a relatively higher risk of moving forward to a more severe stage. Now, things that that take us back to a less severe stage. And here I want to stop a little bit because this is a this is a weird term, and it's it's difficult to explain this and how we consider this regression like at a clinical level. So a lot of transition papers, not just my analysis, have shown that, you know, moving, moving forward, but there's also an improve in lung function. That improve in lung function, it's only considered here and in other studies with a spirometry. We are not considering other studies, you know, like imaging, other type of biomarkers, or uh, treatment, et cetera, or in which level do they stay? If they were like in the lower limit of goal one and then they move back a little bit to goal zero or what happened there? So although we see that in the transition, we just have to take it, you know, very careful. I'm gonna pinch of salt and also consider what the clinician thinks about this 
how we consider because it may not be um, accurate that we say, oh, people are going to regress and they're going to be better because that may not be correct. However, let's say that they can regress and they are better. In terms, we saw that being a female contributes to moving from goal one to going back to goal zero and from goal two to prison. To really, you know, that's, that's where influence in gender. Uh, race, there's no influence into regression, but body max, but, uh, BMI has an important influence, like protective um, effect when you are at a low level. Uh, COPD and obesity, it's a weird, a weird relationship, and it can be seen that people that are on their way have a higher probability of dying than people that have a little bit of overweight. Um, and you see that in the literature, and that can be caused for different, many different things. Then transition probabilities now. For smokers, particularly for smokers, uh, this is transition of smokers and former smokers. As I mentioned, uh, smokers have um, have a lower probability of staying in goal one after five years, but they have higher probability of moving towards goal two or goal three. Mm -hmm. However, form, um, being a former smoker also contributes and give you a higher probability of going back to what we call zero, from prison to zero. So former smoker, so as we see, just repeating the point, go one if you're a smoker, being smoker at early stages definitely contribute to get a worse, uh, but being a former smoker also helps to improve your spirit, uh, your spiritual function if COPD is captured at lower levels. So for this analysis in conclusion, go one and prison are the most dynamic stages low or mild severity of obstruction are more likely to regress. So there's still something that we can do if we capture people there. The sociodemographic factors is not a clear pattern. It's not a clear pattern that follow each of the severity stages. So we have to be very careful of how we um, assess each individual. And the association interventions at early stages is where the effect of the intervention and protective lung function can do the most. Now, for simulation model analysis, we do a lot of, it's important that we consider very carefully what the inputs we are using, because we need to make assumptions of how we use that, uh, how we use that data to transition into, for, uh, into the future. So I add this slides into the presentation so you can be aware of what's the limitation of me using COPD. So COPD is a small sample, they don't have never users. They start including never users, but the sample is very little. Unfortunately, at the time I wanted to do this analysis, they didn't have information of PCR abuses. Well, they have, but they have like 50 individuals, so I couldn't find power to estimate any type of effect. Because the sample is very little, it limits our, ca our capacity to do... Uh, a certification of analysis in more subgroups. For example, for my model, I want to use my ideal certification by, was by gender, age group, and smoking status. And I couldn't do that because the sample became really, really small. Also for the analysis of these transitions, I did not consider other comorbidities of the patient like asthma, cancer, or if they were on treatment. I only using COPD as defined by spirometry values. So no symptoms, no exacerbations or other data from imaging. And this is what I was saying, right? Is the regression actually a regression? Okay, as a second part, uh, then I, we estimate the prevalence and mortality from prison and COPD as they are important parts of the model. And for this, I use NHANES. So why I use NHANES? So I use NHANES because when I was doing my 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 research for my K, I noticed that NHANES was the only survey that had spirometry data. So I thought, yes, NHANES, I'm going to use it. That's going to solve all my problems. And then I said, my, my grant. Then I went back and looked into NHANES. And unfortunately, NHANES only have spirometry during, uh, for three weeks, 2007 to 2012. And then starting in 2013 and 18, they, only, uh, they don't do spirometry anymore. 
they just do um, self-assessment. But I decided to use Enhance either way because spirometry is the way to uh, the gold standard for diagnosis of COPD. The COVID and Enhance is a very complete survey and national representative. We are also going to be able to certify by race in all these different categories, age, and we have to cut out our sample 20 to 80 because spirometry was only taken in a subgroup of 20 to 79 year old. So we don't have a spirometry after 80 years. And then smoking status, this is my definition of smoking status for the analysis. And we use the 100 plus lifetime cigarettes as a cut off, also sex. Now, during our exercise, we construct different definitions of what a COPD could look like. So from 2007 to 2018, you've had an enhance the, the question, uh, does, has a doctor or other health professional ever told, ever told you had chronic bronchitis and epizema? Remember about the limitation that I told you of, of, of this question when being asked by a professional. Then spirometry is only from 2007 to 2012. We also uh, create another variable in which a person could have COPD if either was self-report or spirometry. And then starting in 2013, and that is something that we see a lot in national surveys, they changed the question form. As a doctor or other health professional ever told you that you have chronic bronchitis or emphysema, to say yes if you have ever told, been told by a, by a physician that you have COPD. Um, so yeah. Uh, you know, you can have both of these questions, but they add these questions so that creates another, you know, something that we need to consider into our analysis. Now, when you have COPD, when you have the values of spirometry, you have F1, F, F1 and FBC. Then you have to estimate uh, F1% and predictive equations. And you're gonna see in the literature that I erase the specific predictive equations for our analysis and we were also uh, we consulted an expert uh, in the use of NHANES for the COPD values. We were suggested to use gender-specific but not race-specific uh, predictive equations because that has the way it has been analyzed in NHANES before. And then something that I mentioned, NHANES, NHANES obtained pre- and post bronchodilator data. The sample for prosmic post bronchodilator data, which is the ideal gold standard for, for diagnosis of COPD, it's very little. So usually when you see analysis reported with NHANES and spirometry, it's using pre bronchodilator data. Now we estimated prevalence and mortality. This is just the sample characteristics. And in here, you know, we saw a little bit of smoking status uh, never users during the three waves are usually around 50%. And we have a similar even distribution between current and former. Sorry, because of the small of them. Luce, you have the about small 10 minutes them. to go. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then we've had different severities of COPD. That's just, um, okay. So now in here, I just want to briefly show you how important is the definition that's not only on COPD, but other diseases. Constructed us for self-report, it gave us a prevalence between 6% and 7%. If we use a spirometry, around 14%. If we use our combined, then that prevalence goes almost around 18%, right? So that's what we need to, um, oh, sorry, yeah, I lost my mask. Okay, and in here, there's also, in here, I just stratified by current, former, and never smokers. And, that's, and as you can see here, the trends of COPD have not changed that much during this year, 2012. We see for current smokers, a higher prevalence, a little bit of an increase in prevalence in gold three and four, and a little bit less increase, uh, uh, diagnosis of prison. But for never smokers, we see a small increase in prison diagnosis compared in 2012 compared to previous years. Now, this I put in red, just a little bit of, of how I guided myself in this in this seminar. It's I these slides that I read, I just wanted to highlight and I tried to put it this brick ball because it's the ones that I'm gonna use for inputs into my model. 
So, okay, so when stratified by smoking status current and former, we see the interesting things, particularly because we're including prison, right? So if you see, for current smokers, females have usually have had constantly a higher prevalence of prism than males, but we see a higher prevalence of GO1 for males. However, for current smokers, what was more prevalent is, is GO2 uh, in, the, in those two genders. This is very important because, you know, as, as I've been talking, I've been collaborating with some pulmonologists, and it's hard to find people at prism or goal one at the clinical level. At, at, it's more frequently to find people when they go into the doctor and they are already at goal two. That means that something needs to be done around here to try to capture more population in these stages, but something can be done. Okay. For former smokers, we see the same pattern. Uh, males have higher prevalence of, of GO1, and females have a higher prevalence of PRISM. However, for never smokers, we see that it's, um, there are very similar prevalence of PRISM for males and females. Okay, in this analysis, we also use ENHANCE to estimate all costs and cost-specific mortality risk. So I show you as one of the inputs. We do... We, we did some sensitive, uh, some Cox regression. This black, sorry for the small one. This is just the risk of dying of gold three and four. And as I told you, once you get gold two, and you know it's very easy just to go downfall and get gold two, three and four if you don't die from something else first. Um, then gold, we have gold two as a second term of uh, as a second uh, level of mortality, and this is just compared to people without COPD. Um, I think it gets a little bit more clear in this table. And as you can see, something that strikes me is people at PRISM and people at gold show very similar uh, hazard ratios of risk of all-cause mortality. Uh, for all-cause mortality, also for cancer and cardiovascular diseases. Uh, particularly, it has, been, it has been also preserved in the literature has been associated a lot with death from cardiovascular diseases. So people at prison may not die from, from cancer associated with COPD, but they might die earlier because of cardiovascular diseases. So as a conclusion of this, we saw that overall COPD trends have remained steady, relatively steady through the year. Uh, smokers have higher prevalence of current smokers have higher prevalence of gold two. Female smokers have higher prevalence of prison, and female and male uh, smokers have higher prevalence of gold one. In terms of mortality, we saw that prison and COPD are definitely an increased risk of all cause mortality. However, gold two didn't show that much of any gold one. Sorry, gold one was uh, from all the stage was the one that had lower mortality. Uh, and then also prism and gold two, as I say, what was uh, mentioning before, had similar cardiovascular disease mortality risk. Now, what's the limitation of this study of NHANT? As I mentioned, spirometry are only three waves. We are using preborn collateral values. Although we've done in other analysis, we also did for this study a sensitivity analysis using uh, prosborn collateral values, and I also use did a sensitivity analysis of the transition probability study using pre-bronchial collateral values. And there's a little bit of change, not that much, but still post-bronchial collateral values are the gold standard. We, we, with NHANES, we definitely we could not capture COPD changes with other tobacco products. And that's important because I wanted to include other tobacco products in my analysis. And looking at the literature, there's mainly like cigarette use, not other products or dual use. That's very difficult to find. So if anybody is doing that dual use, other tobacco products, long-term COPD analysis, please let me know. And then COPD diagnosis question has changed over the years. And that's also, you know, something that we know impacts the results. And now um, just to, just to, just to finalize, and it's going to be really fast. It's important and it's very common in, in simulation models to, to do 
uh, meta-analysis or, or systematic literature reviews to obtain the outcomes that we need for uh, the inputs that we need for the model. So systematic literature review is something that I needed to be done. I couldn't escape from it. And we do meta-analysis for lung cancer incidence and mortality rates for people in, in, in COPD. And there are some published of risk of lung cancer in individuals with COPD, but I wanted to do it specifically for the U.S. A lot of the reviews that there exist over there, they just use uh, the, uh, they are global estimates. So I just wanted to see if there was actually a difference with the U.S. So we follow the protocol of systematic literature review. We evaluated three databases. We use mesh terms related with COPD, risk, lung cancer, and smokers. I obtained lung cancer incidence and lung cancer specific mortality. For this specific analysis and the previous one, what I wanted to get, it was mortality of COPD in lung cancer, mortality of lung cancer in individuals with COPD that they correspond to the general population because there are, there are literature that say, okay, in the, for example, individuals with HIV and COPD and the risk of lung cancer or individuals that are always, in, that are uh, receiver of Medicaid and lung cancer. So because those subgroups are specific and they have certain characteristics that doesn't apply to a general population, I focus our research in specific general populations. So we excluded, you know, foreign languages, well, if they were not from the US uh, and they were, and they needed to be their representative special subgroups. Ideally, they were using, you know, uh, representative samples. We didn't use clinical trials, or in hospital mortality or treatments, and then also conference abstracts. Um, sorry for the small uh, for the small size. So we have, um, so as I told you, COPD is a is an umbrella term. So we have COPD. Sometimes they reported uh, results just by emphysema and chronic bronchitis, and the risk of, of lung cancer in individuals with COPD, according to our meta analysis, is one point seven six. And in terms of lung cancer mortality, it's around 1.8. Similar, we use COPD, emphysema, and chronic bronchitis. And as you can see, there's much more studies related that publish in terms of incidence than mortality. Luz, we are about at time, but take a little more time if you need it. Yeah, I, I'm almost done. This okay. is just very small. I just want to show you, we tried to do, we obtain information by smoking status. The, the the reference group and the diagnose and the and how they define smokers varied a lot between studies. We only find one study with our characteristics and reported mortality. And this is just preliminary results. We're working on them and we see if we can obtain um, results uh, to do a meta-analysis. Uh, but definitely there's an, an increase of risk in smokers and smoking and um, and risk of lung cancer. However, when I started doing this meta-analysis, my, my original idea was, oh, I'm going to obtain COPD, uh, lung cancer risk in COPD in smokers, and those results stratify by race or by age. There was one study that stratified by sex, sex and smokers, you know, uh, female smokers or male smokers, but we couldn't find anything that says non hispanic white smokers and the risk of lung cancer or stratified by age. They just did it like separate covariates and none of them all like grouped together. So that was also a limitation because ideally that's what the outcomes that I was expecting to obtain. As I said, results were stratified just by smoking or gender, I could, no other tobacco products. I put in our search, let's look for other tobacco products. We didn't find any other tobacco products results. They all talk about cigarette use. Uh, and there's a, a great variability in smoking status. And just one study reported the risk of, of lung cancer according to the COPD state. And a second literature review that we did, it was a COPD trends, uh, just to see how the trends in the U.S. Uh, using national health surveys. Again, this is our PRISMA diagram. We look at almost 3,000 papers, and we, and we um, extract information for 33. All of them was 
general population, National Representative Health Service from the US. And I just wanna show you, it's really small. I apologize for that. So I'm gonna explain really brief. Self-reported is the circle. Uh, Self-reported and spirometry, it's a square. And just spirometry is the cross. In blue, we have data from BRFSS. In orange, NHIS. And in green, um, sorry, in orange, NHANES. And in green, NHIS. And as you can see, NHIS and BRFSS, they don't have spirometry data. They only have self-reported data. And NHANES is the one that has spirometry. So we can see the difference, right? It's almost double. And something that I mentioned you on my trend. So that's something that we need to be careful. Then I did also try to do other trends by smoking stages. Very little with spirometry. That's the rest of them is self-reported. They do, you can find either never or ever, or never current and former. So that also is varied that we need to consider. Uh, but yeah, it's definitely, you know, BRFSS, and we have other data. This is preliminary data. Uh, but it was important because it's, okay, when we do calibration or when we do validation of the model, which data, which definition we are gonna use and which type of diagnosis? Are we gonna use COPD diagnosed by spirometry? Are we gonna use COPD diagnosed by self-assessment? Are we gonna use COPD diagnosed by self-assessment and spirometry? And I just want to, um, I just added this very brief because this is from the CDC and this is the, the, the trends. When you look at COPD, this is the trends that they see, that they publish, right? And it's BRFSS and it's around 7%, and that's using self-assessment. So when we talk about COPD using these trends, we are missing half of the population that may have COPD and it's undiagnosed. Okay, and finally, I start to build my natural history model. This is all the inputs that I'm gonna use in the model. I also, I also go here like to assumptions. It's very important when you model, do a simulation model, that you state very clearly in your documentation which assumptions you did when the data that you use. And for that, it's that I wanted, that I explained the limitations of all the studies because based on those limitations, uh, that's how we, uh, that's what we uh, plan or make the assumptions, right? I just one example, like for example, COPD prevalence, I put here the COPD, it was, do I do it by gender or do it by smoking status? Okay, we decided by gender. So I need to do the assumption that this prevalence is uh, is not dependent on the smoking status, right? I mean, this is just preliminary results. Uh, also, for example, here, COPD and lung cancer mortality, this is for overall population and it's not adjusted by age and smoking status, which is also important. So now for the conclusion, it's, you know, this is this is the diagram where I started with. I was amazing. Then I need to cut an old decline in Feb1. I also called current e reviews because we couldn't find information about that. Instead of going to goal zero Prisma, then people can move to goal zero. And then from there, goal zero is normal, or either can move Prisma or goal one. Then I didn't stratify by light and heavy smokers. And then I had to change this from goal two to go to go three and four. So I had to modify according to the data that I found. And then finally, I just want to go my research team, my mentoring team, Dr. Maylan Han, who's a pulmonologist expert in COPD at the University of Michigan and Arbor, Andrew Brower, also part of the University of Michigan and the Castor team, David Levy, my mentor at Georgetown, Rafael Mesa, which was a uh, Michigan and ISBC cancer in Canada. And then my research team, Chris Kenda and Rosanna and um, Maria and Pegita, which have been helping me like through all these years and are doing the analysis. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. That's all. Sorry for take longer. That's quite all right. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Luz. Uh, that was an excellent presentation and an immense amount of work that you've been putting into this project over the last uh, couple of years. So it's great to see some of that come to light. Um, yeah, please, folks, submit your questions uh, to the Q&A, um, and I will uh, ask uh, them uh, to the presenter. 
Uh, and I have some questions already coming in. So let me let me pose those to you. I think one question was you you mentioned earlier in the talk that many different things cause COPD. One of them is smoking. Uh, the, what what is the I guess the smoking attributable fraction for COPD, uh, or what percentage of a COPD can be attributed to smoking as opposed to other causes? Oh, you're on mute. Okay. So when you are a smoker, the prevalence that we saw for smoking is if you are a current smoker, the prevalence that have COPD within that group is around forty percent and around like 35% of the former smokers. That's what we usually are finding in the literature. Uh, also, in, when it's non-COPD, uh, when it's non-smoking COPD, it's also around, you know, in that group, it may be, I mean, in the overall population, it's never smokers around 3%. So that's a little mm -hmm. bit, you know, it depends on when we see it. But yeah, and it's, uh, so it's still, I mean, if you're a smoker, you can have a little bit, let's say a little bit that, um, a little bit less than 50% just to develop COPD, something related to that. Also, it also depends, right? With intensity and how long have you smoked and if you smoke with other products as well. And if you have other comorbidities like asthma, a kid, that's very important to develop COPD later in life. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, uh, I think the, the the results for the former versus current smokers were very interesting. There were a couple of questions around that. Uh, it seemed like some of the transition probabilities you presented for COPD transitions were very similar uh, between the two groups. Uh, so the question is, how were the former smokers defined in that analysis, and what would uh, how would uh, adding time since quit for the former smokers, uh, you know, provide more information? So, um, so former smoker for the COPD gene, the way they define smoking, so they intentionally just capture smokers, right? They needed to get into, to get included into that cohort, they needed to have at least uh, more than 10 packs per year consumption of cigarettes that how COPD started, uh, COPD gene started. The only question is like, oh, you know, the you, you're a smoker, but that's, you know, that was like the like, uh, inclusion criteria. And then in their questionnaire, they, they ask, do you currently smoke or, or, you know, and that's currently smoke within a month. That's the question. If they haven't smoked with that month, then they were considered former smokers. That's the definition uh, that they use. They provide intensity. That's why we divided, you know, 20, more than 20 packs per year, less than 20 packs per year. And we saw that more than 20 packs per year, uh, you know, regardless if you're a current or former, then definitely helps into getting to a more severe stage of, of COPD. Um, Yes, they are very similar. I think when we notice the most uh, the most improvement or what they affect is when they are at early stages, right? And it's and that's where it influences. So if you still, you know, if you have already a long time a high intensity of smoking and you start to have symptoms, it's really, you know, it's very important to capture people early, and because that's when making you a former smoker. Helps with re helps reducing your probability of progressing the disease. But once you get diagnosed, particularly if you get captured and get diagnosed with goal two, then you know you can do cessation and it can help, but it doesn't help as much as at the beginning. Wow. Thank you. Um, I think there was there was a question about the COPD definitions in some of the surveillance systems data. Uh, how will you address the challenge of different definitions of COPD in the trans data? It seems the results will vary quite widely depending on the definition you use. So what, how will you deal with that problem as you move forward? That's, that's an interesting question because I've been talking to my mentors like, okay, I have this data. They ask different questions. They define smoking differently. They define smoker differently, even 
even within the same survey, right? They can say, oh, smoking is, it's everybody that says, yes, I smoke cigarettes, or I just, you know, or I have like a hundred and plus threshold. And that makes it different. I will be arguing with that. I don't have an answer at that moment because I want to use the spirometry values for the building my model because spirometry is the, is the gold standard. But then that means that I will have a way to compensate because doing a spirometry gives me a double of the prevalence of just self-assessment, like in overall. Um, I think, you know, we can get from the trends, maybe we can get like an average and some 95% confidence intervals and try to do that as a sensitivity analysis or more like estimates to, you know, to do that range. Um, because although they look a little bit weird in the graph, they are around, you know, within the percentage three, five uh, for never smokers, a little bit around 12, uh, 13 for, ne for smokers and former smokers around seven, seven to nine percent. And that's what I've seen in the results. But we're still analyzing those results on trends. But yeah, I saw it. I was like, why? Why do you change it? And everyone, we see people diagnosed COPD with good question, with spirometry, using ICD-10 codes. So it's very different, and I just can't give you different things. Yeah, this challenge for many fields, some standardization of these, these major definitions would be helpful. Uh, I think we have room for one more question, and I think I'll go to the question about career development, uh, because uh, you've been a successful in getting your K award, and moving into the field of tobacco regulatory science, coming from a different area of public health. What advice would you give to somebody getting into this field and also you know, getting started with a cable? Uh, just maybe two or three pieces of advice before we wrap up. Uh, so K01, well, K, it's, I think this is my personal experience. Look at the K with like, how you start your PhD, a lot of people have doing, I assume, you know, doing the PhD. That when you start your PhD, you have this enormous idea, perfect with all the estimates. And then once you end up your PhD, it was maybe like a quarter of what would you plan. And it may be not as, you know, as exciting as, as you thought at the beginning. And we can see that with my model. So do it, but also... Something that has keep helping me a lot is my mentoring team. So find a good mentoring team, talk to them, people that have experience with these awards because they can help you develop, you know, more accurate of what NIH is expecting in terms of how much you can do, what it's realistic, right? You're not going to develop amazing stuff or, or very complicated stuff in the amount of time you have. And think about it as a first step into moving forward to bigger grants because then my my plan, and I talk to mentors, is using this K, and you use it as a platform to get an R01 or another R grant. And then you use that R01 to start building into what you constructed with the K. So I'm using this K to build my basic model, and I intend to develop my R, building into what I created into the model to make it more complicated or, you know, to give me more specific data. Also, yes, please find someone, if it's a topic that n nobody knows in your group, find a mentor that knows about that topic because they can give you, you know, things where to go, things that are innovative, and they give you another set of eyes of how you view the problem. Excellent. Thank you so much, Luzba, for this wonderful presentation. It was very informative. And thank you all for joining us today. Again, uh, we'll send a short survey out, uh, so please fill it out. Um, it's only a few minutes. It'll take you maybe two minutes to do it. And look out for future events. We have another well, webinar coming up soon uh, by Dr. Krishna Reddy, so we look to forward to seeing you there. Thank you very much, and uh, goodbye.